Welcome to the Agora Cafe. Uh, usually uh, videos of this sort have titles like 14 things you didn't know about such and such, but I think that's presumptuous. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you know about this. Besides, if you're interested enough in a topic to click on a video about it, there's a good chance you probably already know some of the info. So this is 14 things you may not have known about the three musketeers. So next up, Paris. Number one, The Three Musketeers was the first book in a trilogy. So The Three Musketeers came out in 1844 it was followed one year after by the sequel, 20 years after, in 1845. And then uh, over the period of 1847 to 1850, uh, the third novel, these, because these all originally came out in serialized form before they came out in standalone form. The uh, third novel, Le Vicomte de Bragelonne, or 10 years later, uh, appeared. Uh, although that's officially one book it's so long that it's usually published in three volumes, uh, but they are all officially one book. So it's a kind of a trilogy within a trilogy. When it's published in three volumes, the individual volumes are usually titled Le Vicomte de Bragelonne, Louise de la Valliere, and The Man in the Iron Mask. Uh, sometimes it's published in four volumes, in which case they generally redistribute the uh, material among the four volumes and they add a volume, I think usually the second one. Uh, titled 10 years later, uh, borrowing the subtitle. Um, by the way, there's a new translation forthcoming that, that looks like it's going to have different titles, at least some different titles, but I'll have more about that in a bit. So anyway, there's a, you know, there are three books of this and the third book is actually three books. So, uh, there's a lot of musketeers. Second, why the first book is titled The Three Musketeers rather than The Four Musketeers. Uh, the fact that the book actually has four protagonists, D'Artagnan, Athos, Portos, and Aramis, is well known enough that I didn't include it as one of the, the facts you may not have known. Excuse me, but there's four of us. But you may not know why it's called The Four Musketeers, The Three Musketeers rather than The Four Musketeers given that there are four protagonists. Well, the answer is that D'Artagnan does not actually become a musketeer until the end of the book. He's just hanging out with the three musketeers, hoping to become a musketeer. He doesn't actually end up being one until the end. Um, by the end of it, he is. So that the later, you know, the, so the whole series should not be called the three musketeers, although it sometimes is, uh, because it really the whole series is about four musketeers, but the book is about three. Because you might then wonder, uh, given that D'Artagnan is not one of the Three Musketeers, why, you know, why make the title The Three Musketeers rather than say D'Artagnan and the Three Musketeers, particularly given that D'Artagnan is the main character? Well, I don't know the answer to that for sure, but I suspect it's precisely because D'Artagnan is the main character that we're seeing things from his point of view. And so we're seeing, you know, this is his adventure with the Three Musketeers. It's kind of like, you know, Sherlock Holmes is the main character in The Hound of the Baskervilles or, or The Adventure of Charles Augustus Milverton. The Hound of the Baskervilles is not the main character. Charles Augustus Milverton is not the main character. But those are the adventures that Sherlock Holmes had with those particular um, persons or organisms. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm seeing it from his point of view, the same way that um, uh, the first Indiana Jones movie was titled uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. They've since retitled it Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, but the original was just Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and in fact, when the title credit appears on the screen, that's what you see. Third, The Three Musketeers had a black or at least a biracial author. Alexandre Dumas was the grandson of a Haitian slave. While well, 19th century France was not exactly a paradise of racial tolerance, it was obviously you know, 
obviously pretty clearly superior to the US of the same era. Uh, and an author of visibly African ancestry was able to become France's most commercially successful author in that era, maybe in any era. Uh, there's an anecdote that he once responded to a racial insult by saying, it is true, my father was a mulatto, my grandmother was a negress, and my great grandparents were monkeys. In short, sir, my pedigree begins where yours ends. Which reminds me a bit of, uh, of an exchange in, uh, in Rostand's play, Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, uh, now the, the joke is a little bit uncomfortable because it, it may seem as though Dumas is um, endorsing uh, his opponent's racism against his own ancestors, even if not against himself. I'm not sure that he is, but uh, it's just a little, a little bit dodgy, but it's still, you know, it does, you know, it was in the context of good comeback. Uh, in 1843, they, uh, Dumas released a novel, Georges, about a free man of black ancestry who leads a slave revolt in Mauritius. And that's sort of his own personal response to the issues of slavery and racial prejudice. Um, that um, I'm surprised that, there ha as far as I know, there hasn't been a movie version made of that. And I'm surprised that there hasn't been. Um, now, again, the same worry that I raised before about his little this little Cyrano-esque response to the racist uh, insult uh, comes up here. The um, uh, the way that full-blooded blacks, that is, blacks of unmixed African ancestry, are treated in the book is a little bit racist. I mean, he's against enslaving them. That's you know, yay. But uh, you know, they do seem to come across as rather inferior to the mixed-race protagonist. Um, is obviously you know, based on uh, either Dumas himself or perhaps his father. Uh, and some of the, those racist portrayals are kind of soft peddled in the most recent uh, translation. Um, but anyway, uh, there it is. Oh, by the way, um, he, uh, Dumas seems to have drawn from the same well uh, as he, uh, for this novel, as for his uh, Count of Monte Cristo the following year. Uh, in, I mean, it was released the following year. I'm not sure how long it took him to write the Count of Monte Cristo. I would guess it was more than a year. It is a whacking long book. Uh, but anyway, uh, in both of them, you have a protagonist who's returning years later after having been wronged coming back in a disguised identity and now in a, with a more elite status uh, to take revenge on those who wronged him earlier. Um, and by the way, you know, digression time, but hey, uh, this is digression city here. Um, uh, I have a theory that uh, the Count of Monte Cristo in turn inspired Victor Hugo's uh, Les Miserables. Um, you know, that I think that Hugo took the two sides of the character of Edmond Dantes, the main character in uh, Mont Count of Monte Cristo, and he split them into two characters. So on the one hand, there's Dantes, the former convict, unjustly condemned, who escapes the eyes of the law and reinvents himself as a, you know, as a uh, member of the elite. And that seems like he's the forerunner of Jean Valjean. In fact, Hugo even has uh, Jean Valjean make an escape in a, uh, in a coffin, which is the same thing that Dantes does. So I think Dantes actually has, I think Dantes version of that scene is actually more Hugo-esque than Hugo's is, but um, on the other hand, Dantes, the implacable pursuer of vengeance, who you know, pursues the, uh, uh, the objects of his wrath through the course of the book until he eventually learns to forswear vengeance at the end is the forerunner not of Valjean but of Javert. So in effect uh, Hugo uh, took the main character of the Count of Monte Cristo, split him into two and had one of them spend the novel chasing the other one uh, which is a, a clever idea. Four. 
Dumas wrote the Musketeers series with a co-author. A lot of Dumas' books were written uh, with co-authors whose names never appear on the covers. And often they don't appear inside either. Or sometimes they're relegated to brief asides and introductions or other editorial material. Or often they're just omitted entirely. For example, the aforementioned novel Georges was co-authored with Jean-Pierre uh, Jean Felicien Malpi, who uh, never appears on the covers uh, or on the title pages of uh, Existence of Georges. And as of the date of this video, uh, May 2021, uh, his name is not mentioned on the Wikipedia page for the novel Georges. Dumas' most important collaborator was Auguste Maquet. And I spelled his name there on the screen for you so that you won't mistake him for one of my ancestors. Uh, uh, Maquet was the co-author of a number of Dumas' most celebrated works, including the Musketeers novels and The Count of Monte Cristo and a bunch of others. Now there's a lot of disagreement as to what the relative roles were of Dumas and Maquet in, uh, in producing their co-authored works. So at one extreme, you've got the view that Maquet was merely a research assistant who provided sort of bare bones outline or historical material and so forth. And then Dumas came in and you know, completely made something out of it that wasn't there. At the other end of the, uh, the other extreme, there's the view that uh, Maquis was really a ghost writer. He really wrote it all. And Dumas just added his name to someone else's work. Uh, in 1845, uh, a guy named Eugène de Mircourt, actually, that wasn't his real name, but anyway, he published a, a book called Dumas Novel Factory, uh, which he, in which he claimed that Dumas just ran this big factory where uh, other people would write these novels and he would just stick his name on them. Um, also, the, the, this, uh, this book was filled with racially charged insults against uh, uh, Dumas. Now, I read a fair bit about this issue. I've read multiple Dumas biographies. I've read the notes, the Oxford translations, which are really good notes. I've read Gustave Simon's Histoire d'une collaboration, which includes lots of uh, documents uh, uh, relative to this. And um, my judgment is that the truth is in between those two extremes. Uh, I don't think that Maquet was merely a research assistant. I don't think Maquet was the ghost writer uh, that Dumas simply slapped his name onto the works of. Now, I'm not saying that Dumas never did that with anyone. Uh, it's true that, for example, one of uh, Dumas' last works, when, when both his energy and his finances were flagging, was a two-volume novel about Robin Hood. There was just a streamlined translation of an English language novel by Pierce Egan the Younger from 1840 titled Robin Hood and Little John. Uh, and Dumas didn't even do the translation. Uh, it, it looks like the translation was probably done by Dumas' mistress, Marie de Fernand, who uh, used to write under the name of Victor Perceval. Of course, she didn't get credit for the translation either. Um, uh, but anyway, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a translation, somewhat abridged, of this English language novel. Now, the edition that was published, does, it admittedly doesn't say by Alexandre Dumas, it says published by Alexandre Dumas. Um, and also bear in mind, this came out posthumously, so we don't know how Dumas himself would have handled it, and whether he would have claimed more credit than this edition implies or less credit than this edition implies. But anyway, it does say published by, which was technically accurate. Um, but given that it doesn't name the actual author, uh, anyone buying it would have assumed they wouldn't have known that published by had some special coded meaning and they would have assumed that this was a novel by Dumas as many people have indeed uh, assumed. Uh, in fact, this two volume Robin Hood novel by 
uh, Dumas was later rendered back into English as a pair of novels, The Prince of Thieves and Robin Hood the Outlaw. By a translator, didn't realize that the work had started out in English to begin with and didn't need to be retranslated back into English. If you compare the retranslated Dumas version with the original Egan book, you know, it's pretty clear that apart from some streamlining, as I said, they are essentially the same work. Amusing footnote, a later Spanish translation was attributed, no, this is no fault of Dumas either, uh, a later Spanish translation was attributed to Sir Walter Scott, the author of Ivanhoe. I guess, sorry, as an analytic philosopher, I'm supposed to call him the author of Waverly. Some of you will get that. Um, but anyway, uh, as I said, so you know, this sort of thing did sometimes happen, but as far as I've been able to determine that that is not descriptive of the Dumas-Maquet collaboration. Dumas just did not just stick his name on stuff that Maquet wrote. Now, each of the extreme views is true of some chapters of the works that Dumas and Maquet did together. And that fact is what has fueled each of the extreme views. There were cases, there were uh, chapters or passages where Dumas just did rubber stamp what Maquet had written. So for example, there's a famous anecdote, which as far as I can tell is true, um, that one time when Maquet was challenged by someone to prove that he really was a collaborator with Dumas, given that his name didn't appear on the covers. And, uh, and so he was challenged to insert an awkwardly repetitive phrase, like the word que, I think it was the word que, que, uh, you know, like seven times in a row in a short, in a short span. Um, he was challenged to insert that into the next installment of the book he was writing with Dumas. And he did. And you know, Dumas approved it, uh, and it came out and uh, proved his point. Now, there are other chapters where Maquet really did just provide a very sketchy, sketchy framework or some historical details. And Dumas did all the work of filling in the details and giving it life and color and so forth. And there are other chapters that were in between. There are other chapters that were sort of more of a 50-50 collaboration. And so when you put it all together, I think that uh, they were roughly equal collaborators in, you know, in the whole thing, uh, even though you know, the, the relative contributions varied from section to section, but if you take the whole work, uh, I think that they, uh, um, you know, for, for any of the given works that they collaborated on, I think that they, these were genuine collaborations. Uh, the reason that they were, um, that they were published without his name, it wasn't something that Dumas insisted on, although Dumas didn't fight against it particularly either, but the publisher, Dumas was already famous for works he'd done on his own. I mean, he, he, it wasn't that he was you know, some sort of hack who was incapable of writing without a collaborator. He, he published a lot of stuff on his own. In fact, in plays mostly, he'd gotten his start in, in drama rather than novels. But anyway, he was a, a well-known enough and popular enough figure that publishers figured that people would be more likely to, to buy a work by Alexandre Dumas than a book by Alexandre Dumas and Auguste Maquet. And so that's why the name was left off. But I still think it's kind of a scandal that the that McKay's name is still left off. It's Naz doesn't appear on the cover, covers of of uh, the works they collaborated on. Doesn't appear on the title page. Often doesn't isn't even mentioned anywhere in the book. And you know I think it should be there. Um, now someone might say, well look, McKay's right to be identified. Uh, as the author was decided and rejected in an 1858 lawsuit. Uh, but I don't think a 19th century French court case has any bearing on what a publisher's obligations are, and their moral obligations in particular. I mean, whether this is a legal obligation or not, you know, that's not my concern, but it seems like it's a moral obligation 
whether to Maquet or to the publisher's readers, you know, if you're publishing something that's really by Dumas and Maquet, and you're saying it's by Maquet, uh, sorry, you're saying it's by Dumas, and you're sort of dropping Maquet through the memory hole, I think that's an injustice both to the readers and to Maquet. Come on. So I think that, you know, I'd be in favor of a kind of pressure movement to get publishers to put Maquet's name back on the cover. In general, I think that when their works, we have good reason to think we're co-authored. The co-author's name should go back on the covers. I think Harriet Taylor's uh, name should be on the cover of, of Mills on Liberty. I think that Rose Wilder Lane's name should be there along with her mother's on the Little House books, uh, in my opinion. Uh, a footnote to this little discussion. In 2010, there was a French language movie about the Dumas Maquet uh, collaboration called L'autre Dumas, the other Dumas. Um, there were a, you know, uh, a couple of unfortunate things about that movie. I haven't seen the movie, uh, so I can't, um, I think I own it somewhere, but I haven't gotten around to seeing it. Uh, so I, I can't evaluate it on, as a, a, a general. But the two unfortunate things about it, one is that the uh, the role of Dumas is played by Gérard Depardieu, who is not exactly a black actor. Uh, so they basically whitewashed the role of Dumas. And the, uh, the other unfortunate thing is that the English language version of the movie is instead of being called the other Dumas, it's just called Dumas. Yeah, it just, you know, once again, sorry, Maquet, you know, kick you off the boat, knock you under the bus, whatever. Uh, so that a book that's a, a, mo a movie that's about the Dumai, Dumas Maquet collaboration, this drops Maquet out of the title in the English language version. I mean, you know, what, what the hell? Um, so that's sort of, you know, so one, uh, you, know, uh, you know, an injustice to uh, Dumas and injustice to Maquet all wrapped into uh, one unfortunate package. Number five, the four musketeers were real people. So, uh, you know, there are lots of characters in the musketeers novels that are obviously real historical figures. You've got Louis the Thirteenth and Louis the Fourteenth of uh, France. You've got King Charles the First of England. You've got Louis de Valier and uh, Anne of Austria. You've got Cardinal Richelieu and his successor, Cardinal Mazarin. Even the man in the Iron Mask, whoever he really was, there was a real man in the Iron Mask. In fact, I thought about making that one of the um, ones in the list. But there have been a number of YouTube videos about the man in the Iron Mask, and so I think it's it's reasonably well known that that was a real person, um, even if we're not sure who he was, even though also the, the mask wasn't iron, it was um, cloth, which is fairly preferable. Uh, anyway, so it, the, the novels are filled with uh, actual historical figures, but a lot of people still may not know that the four protagonists were also real people. So the main character, uh, Charles de Basse de Castelmore uh, d'Artagnan, who lived from 1611 to 1673. Uh, he was the basis for d'Artagnan. He didn't do most of the things that he's portrayed as doing in the book. Most of those things were in, in the books. Most of those things were invented. But there were some, you know, some crucial bits uh, that were accurate. He was an agent for Louis XIV and Cardinal Mazarin. He did arrest uh, Nicolas Fouquet, Louis XIV's finance minister, uh, whom uh, Louis had him arrest for more or less the reasons um, uh, that he really did. Um, now the uh, you know the novel uh, backdates D'Artagnan a bit, makes him a bit older, so that he he gets to have adventures under the reign of Louis XIII and uh, and Cardinal Richelieu as well, whereas. 
in fact, D'Artagnan was significantly younger than uh, uh, portrayed, and that the, he wouldn't have been uh, in a position to to do a lot of the things in the first book. Uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, uh, D'Artagnan was a real character. There really was a guy named that who did you know, at least some of the things that are described in the books. Now, as for the other three, the titular three musketeers, uh, Athos, Portos, and Aramis, uh, Dumas probably did not know their full names. In fact, he may have even thought the characters were fictional. I'll say more about that in a bit. Um, at any rate, he treats the names Athos, Portos, and Aramis as pseudonyms. In fact, the subtitle of the preface of the first book uh, reads, in which it is established that Despite their names ending in os and is, the heroes of our story are in no way mythological. So we saw the forms of their names as, you know, as looking like Greek names as, and reminiscent of, of Greek myth. And so he assumed that they were, uh, whether he thought they were real people or not, he assumed that these would, would have been pseudonyms. And so he gave them real names uh, instead of the pseudonyms. But in fact, they did have real names different from the ones he gave them. And their real names were basically, you know, Atos, Portos, and Adamis, or pretty close. Uh, so uh, Atos, uh, whom Dumas uh, calls, or Dumas and Mackay, so even I'm, even I'm falling into treating Dumas as the sole author. Stop it. Uh, uh, Dumas and Mackay call him the Comte de la Fer, but his uh, real name was Armand Seigneur de Sieg et Datos et d'Otavier. Um, as for Portos, uh, 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 Dumas and Maquet make his real name Baron du Vallon de Brassier de Pierrefonds, but uh, his real name was Isaac de Porto, no S, uh, and uh, finally, Aramis, whom Dumas and Marquet make give the real name René d'Herblay, d'Herblay, his real name, in fact, was Henri d'Aramis. Uh, so they really were named Atos, Porto, and Aramis. Um, and, uh, however, unlike D'Artagnan, there's no reason to think that they did any substantial portion of the things that Dumas and Marquet have them do in the books. Um, uh, Dumont McKay assert these four, insert these four characters into various real life historical events that they were not actually involved in and make them sort of central to those events, which is how this sort of fiction works. Uh, now, if you're interested in the four real figures, there's a book uh, by Carrie Mond, I don't, Mound, Mond, I'm not sure you pronounce it, and Phil Nansen called The Four Musketeers. The True Story of D'Artagnan, Athos, Portos, and Aramis. Uh, and this also, this book also has uh, some nice photos of some of the locations, like the est estates where they, uh, these characters lived and so on. Um, so it's a, uh, uh, nice book. Um, I did notice a couple of errors in it, and I always worry when I know when I notice a couple of errors in historical work. I always worry, you know, are there other ones I'm not noticing? So, for example, they they cite uh, they, they cite the uh, the Robin Hood novel as one of Dumas' works. Uh, you know, they're 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 well aware of McKay. And they're not wrong about that. But when it comes to the Robin Hood novel, they cite that as one of Dumas' works without seemingly being aware that Dumas had pretty much nothing to do with that book. Six, the real D'Artagnan was kind of a bad guy. Uh, so if you look at you know, what uh, D'Artagnan did, well, first of all, of course, there's the, the arrest of Nicolas Fouquet, the thing for which historically he's most famous. And that's a bit dodgy. Uh, it's, it's very far from clear that Fouquet was guilty of the things that uh, that Louis accused him of um, and his his arrest and imprisonment uh, you know, 
do not seem to have uh, uh, really lived up to the standards of procedural justice, even, even those of the era. Uh, also, the real D'Artagnan, and this is something that doesn't get as much play in the books, he helped put down rebellions of impoverished peasants who'd been driven to desperation by high royal taxes. Uh, he also participated in the sneak attack that Louis XIV carried out on the province of Franche-Comté, which was an you know, independent province at the time, at the time when Louis' ambassadors were there lulling it with peace talks and negotiations. You know, Hi, we're here to, you know, to make peace and, and, uh, and work out... Uh, well, I mean, they weren't at war with them, but I mean, you know, so it wasn't you know, as yet. They were, it was just talks about how they're going to, uh, you know, successfully maintain uh, the neutrality uh, that Franche Comte wanted to have between, in battles between France and, and its neighbors. And uh, in the middle of these peace talks, Louis XIV just pulls a sneak attack and conquers the place. Um, uh, so that he could then use it as a bargaining chip to to trade for uh, uh, peace with was it England he was fighting probably when in doubt it's usually England um, and that so that's kind of dodgy too and D'Artagnan was one of the leaders of the the troops in that little adventure. Now you might say to me, Oh Roderick, you are judging uh, the past by modern standards, uh, you know. D'Artagnan would not have thought that he could have questioned the authority of the king. He would have, you know, he would have thought that the, the word of the king was, uh, was law. And, uh, you know, and so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't judge him by our modern anti-monarchical standards. Well, first of all, it's wrong philosophically because uh, moral relativism is bullshit. But that would be another video. I won't get into it. But it's also historically wrong. It's not the case that uh, the idea that royal authority uh, was unjustified was somehow an idea inaccessible to 17th century thought. Um, obviously, the people who were who were rebelling, you know, these these impoverished peasants who were rebelling against uh, the king. Obviously, they thought rebellion against the king was justified. So you can't say, oh, well, no one then thought that. And also, you know, if you go to the level of scholars, uh, you know, in France, you have the Monarchamox, which are a, a bunch of uh, French scholars uh, who were uh, defending uh, resistance to royal authority. Um, and across the channel during the same period, 16th, 17th centuries. You've got John Milton with his tenure of kings and magistrates. You've got Richard Overton with his arrow against all tyrants and tyranny. You've got people like John Lilburn and William Walwyn and so forth. Um, so the, uh, the question of the uh, legitimacy of royal authority was a live issue at the time. There were people who were who were writing against the authority of kings. There were people who were taking up arms against the authority of kings. So you can't just say, oh, well, back then, no one would have dreamed of questioning the authority of the king. Uh, no, there was a real disagreement, and D'Artagnan was on the wrong side of it. Uh, now, it is true uh, in, uh, on D'Artagnan's behalf that a number of historical sources report that the real-life D'Artagnan uh, treated uh, the people who came under his, uh, you know, people that became captives of his or, or whatever, he treated them with more respect and less cruelty than a lot of other people did. And okay, cool, great for him. But it doesn't get you off the hook. You know, if um, you know, the mugger grabs my wallet but doesn't beat me up is better than the mugger grabs my wallet and also beats me up, but still not gonna praise him as some kind of heroic figure. Um, Seven, The Three Musketeers was based on a previous historical novel by somebody else. Uh, so in 1700, uh, this guy named Gastien de Courtier de Sandras, 
who published lots of historical novels, generally in the form of, of fake memoirs, published Memoirs of Monsieur D'Artagnan, this that's the three volume uh, work, uh, which I have the, uh, uh, this old English language version of, um, uh, beautifully bound thing uh, that I have here. Um, see the first page of it there's she touch on y'all and there's the cover I'll find it when I when I edit this video I'll find a uh, picture of this online because I've seen it online and uh, you'll be able to see it better than this but anyway the first, the first volume, the pages have been cut. The second and third volumes, the pages are uncut. So someone never got, whoever previously owned this never got their way past the, uh, the first volume. Uh, this came to me in, I still have the, uh, the sheet from the bookseller uh, that I got it from in the mail. Bristow and Garland, antiquarian and secondhand booksellers. Six, King Edward's Court. Abbey Walk, Shaftesbury, Dorset. Uh, uh, anyway, it's a very, uh, very well preserved. Well, from the fact that obviously, you, know, you call it used, but the, um, you know, the second and third volumes were, were not really used in the sense that no one ever read them. Uh, it's in, they're in very nice condition. Um, I haven't read them either. Obviously, the pages are uncut, but uh, I'd like to uh, get around to reading that. Uh, work at some point, inshallah. Um, anyway, uh, so this was a fictionalized memoir of, uh, of D'Artagnan. It was written as it was as though D'Artagnan was writing his autobiography. Um, and then the Three Musketeers, the, the novel by Dumas and Maquet, uh, cites this, these memoirs as though they were genuine and treats them as a source for the novel alongside another set of memoirs, an entirely non-existent set of memoirs by Atos. Uh, so this kind of cute little, you know, what the, uh, what the ninth floor folks call intertextuality um, here. Uh, you know, so, I mean, Dumas and Marquis certainly knew that these were not real. Uh, memoirs. Um, now we have no evidence of whether our four protagonists were friends in real life, but it was it was not Dumas Maquet, but rather Cotis de Sandras who first came up with the idea of making Atos, Portos, and Aramis into an inseparable brotherhood, and had them join up with D'Artagnan. And uh, this idea of these these three guys with the uh, Greek sounding endings to their names, uh, Dumas and Maquet found in Coty de, de Sandras' book. They didn't invent that. Uh, they may have thought uh, that, unlike D'Artagnan, who they certainly knew was a real person, they may have thought that Atos, Portos, and Aramis were Sandras' invention, um, but they weren't. Uh, Dumas Maquet also borrowed more broadly from uh, from Corti de Sandras. Uh, for example, one of the chief antagonists in the Three Musketeers is the Comte de Rochefort, who's actually drawn not from the D'Artagnan memoirs, but from another one of of Corti de Sandras's novels, the memoirs of the Comte de Rochefort. Uh, likewise, another one of the chief antagonists of the Three Musketeers. Milady de Winter is based partly on a character in the memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan, where she's also referred to as Milady, but also partly on the character in one of Corti de Sandras's other novels. So uh, this was an important source uh, for um, uh, uh, for them. Uh, now it's been pointed out that most of the events that Dumas and Maquet borrow uh, from uh, 
from these fake memoirs of, of D'Artagnan are borrowed from the first volume. Um, and so it's possible that they, the Dumas Maquet, like the owners of, of my edition, former owners of my edition, only read the first volume and didn't get any farther, uh, decided to, you know, after that they could make it up on their own. Uh, but anyway, that's the seventh fact you may not have known. Eight, no good modern translation of the whole Musketeers trilogy exists as yet. You know, now there are good translations of the first book. I think Richard Pevere is probably one of the best. Um, uh, by the way, the one of the best known covers of Pevere's book has has a cover that may, has, has a cover that makes it look as though it's a graphic novel, but it's not. The uh, it's a bait and switch. The uh, the you know, it's a comic book cover, but the inside is just straight text. But anyway, Richard Revere's book, that's probably the best translation of the, of the first book in the series. But as of the date of this video, May 2021, there is no really good translation of the entire series. Um, unlike you know, some of Dumas' other works, uh, for example, The Count of Monte Cristo has a... Uh, uh, as a good translation, uh, I would recommend the the Robin Bus translation from Penguin. Uh, if you uh, are looking for a good translation of that, uh, but um, uh, but anyway, that may be, but that may be about to change, uh, which I'll mention in a bit. Uh, I want to quote a bit from uh, Richard Pevere's introduction to his translation. So, quote. Les Trois Mousquetaires was translated into most European languages soon after it was published. Three English versions appeared in 1846. One of these versions by William Barrow is still available in the Oxford World's Classics. It is a good and faithful translation following the original almost word for word. Its one major flaw is due, I assume, not to the translator, but to the greater delicacy of English manners at that time. All of the explicit and many of the implicit references to sexuality and the human body, matters which Dumas dealt with rather frankly, asterisk, Dumas and McGay, goddammit, have been removed. That makes the rendering of certain scenes between D'Artagnan and Milady, for instance, strangely vague. Unfortunately, some of the more recent English versions, including those most widely available today, are textbook examples of bad trans translation practice and give the readers an extremely distorted notion of Dumas' writing. The translators seem to have made it a rule to look at the original and do otherwise, as though following, following Dumas carefully would infringe upon their own creativity. We want to express our individuality too. On another man's work? What the heck? Their versions are verbose, paraphrastic, and dull. One adds a sort of blustery Colonel Blimp humor that corresponds to nothing in the French. Another has the habit of saying elaborately twice what Dumas says simply once, end quote. Uh, yeah, and I think Pevere is right. Most of the existing modern translations are not great. And the Oxford translations, uh, he's just talking about Oxford translation of the first book, but the, um, the Oxford World's Classics translations of the entire series all date from between 1846 and 1856 and they are you know they're faithful but they're old-fashioned uh the um the language is a bit archaic and you know they're a bit skittish about sexuality um now i have to say the oxford world's classic traditions are really good for their notes so even if when you're reading a you know if you're even reading a newer translation it's not a bad idea to get a, you know your hands on the oxford tradition and look at the notes they're really really useful notes. Okay, now remember I said this might be about to change. Uh, Lawrence Ellsworth has undertaken to translate the entire series in a modern, uh, modern translations. And from what I can tell, uh, I haven't, can't say I've made a systematic comparison, but from what I can tell, 
uh, from looking into them. Uh, seems like uh, he's doing a good job. The uh, so he's he's come up with the, the translation of the first book, The Three Musketeers. Uh, the second book, uh, he's broken into two. The book 20 years after, he's broken into two volumes. He does seem to be trying to really milk this this series, as we'll see. But um, he broke the second book into two volumes. The first one is also called 20 Years After. But the second one is called Blood Royal. And then later this year, the, later this year, the first of a projected four-volume version of Le Comte de Bragelonne is coming out. And the first volume is called between two kings, which is a a new title uh, unique to Ellsworth, and uh, you know, what he's going to call the next three, I don't know. Um, so uh, he's going to have, uh, you know, he's going to have seven volumes in. Uh, and so far, I think they're only available in, in hardback, if I'm right about that. Um, you know, big hefty things. Um, but anyway, so it looks like uh, we are on the way to having a decent translation of the whole series. Nine. There's a fourth book in the Musketeers trilogy. So in 1865, Dumas began writing, and this time it really is Dumas. He it looks like he didn't have help from any collaborator this time. He began writing a novel titled Le Comte de Moray or the Red Sphinx. Which you might, and you might think that, you know, the or means that the Red Sphinx is Le Comte de Moray, but it's not. They're two different characters. Le Comte de Moray is one character, a real person historically, by the way. And the Red Sphinx is our old friend Cardinal Richelieu, who's one of the main characters in The Three Musketeers. Are you our Cardinal Armand Duplessis de Richelieu, first minister of Louis XIII? We and this book has been described as a fourth Musketeers novel. Excuse me, but there's four of us. And at least it is sort of a fourth Musketeers novel. I say sort of because the four Musketeers do not actually appear in it. But uh, Le Comte de Moray follows on chronologically, fairly directly from the first novel, and features many of the same historical figures, most notably, as I mentioned, Richelieu, the subtitular. Red Sphinx. And the characters are portrayed in ways that are continuous with their portrayal in the Musketeers novel. Um, so you could say that Le Comte de Moray is a novel that shares the same fictionalized historical universe uh, with, uh, with the other ones. Uh, and so I think that it's, it's a little bit misleading to call it a sequel to The Three Musketeers, which is uh, uh, what what uh, what it's been called, but um, uh, you know, nevertheless, I think it, it's fair enough to make it part of the same series. I think if you're reading the whole series, I, I would recommend throwing that one in there. Now, unfortunately, Dumas never finished Le Comte de Moray, but he did have an earlier short story dating back from 1851 called The Dove, and The Dove covered some of the same material as what the ending of Le Comte de Moray would have covered. So our friend Lawrence Ellsworth, the same one who's doing this massive seven volume translation of uh, the Musketeer series, is really an eight, eight volume series because he has taken Le Comte de Moray and the Dove and glued them together uh, to make one uh, one whole novel. Now, it's not quite seamless, um, but still, uh, the Dove does resolve, you know, a number of the plot threads that, that get raised in in, uh, in uh, Le Comte de Moray. And he's called the whole book The Red Sphinx, uh, you know, thus borrowing the subtitle of one of the two things he's doing together as the title for the whole thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, and you know, he builds it as a sequel to the Three Musketeers. Again, I think it's somewhat misleading advertising. Um, and of course, all the other editions of his of his translations, of which are books that were co-authored by McKay. I'll just say Dumas on the cover, not McKay. So I think that's also misleading. Uh, you know, I still think you know, justice for McKay. God damn it! But anyway. Um, 
uh, I have one other quarrel with uh, with um, Ellsworth's translation of the Red Sphinx and the quarrel. Well, I will simply read to you from his introduction, and you'll see what my quarrel is. He's talking about the differences between Dumas' original manuscript and the version that was published. And he says, the manuscript contained an entire chapter omitted from the published version. Upon reading this missing chapter titled Les Apitués de l'Hôtel de Rambouillet, one quickly sees why it was omitted, as it is no more than 3,500 words about the amusing eccentricities of certain members of the Rambouillet household and social set. This series of anecdotes, mainly lifted from the Historiette of Talmont de Rayot, are just the kind of juicy historical gossip that Dumas delighted in, for they add exactly nothing to the progress of the novel. In fact, they stop the book dead in its tracks. I think Dumas, or his editor, Jules Noriac, made the right decision in leaving this chapter out, and I followed their example for this edition of The Red Sphinx. Well, I'd rather like to know whether the decision to exclude that chapter from the final published edition was that of Dumas or his editor. Because if it was the editor, then I think that the chapter is integrally part of the novel as Dumas intended and should have been left in. I don't think it's part of a translator's job to decide, oh, this chapter slows down the action, so I'm going to omit it. Uh, one reader's plot slowing the aggression may be another reader's delight. Uh, anyway, I think it's a dereliction of translatorial duty to impose one's own judgment there in, in place of the author. And even if Dumas did decide to cut it out, I would at least have included it in an appendix. So I'm a little bit grumpy about that. Uh, you know, so when I look at this translation by Ellsworth, I can still ask, you know, you know, uh, are you he that would, should come or do we wait for another? 10. Dumas and McKay adapted the Musketeers novels for the stage. Uh, so in 1845, Dumas and McKay adapted the second book 20 years after as a play, uh, which they gave the name The Musketeers. They didn't call it The Three Musketeers because they're you know, by this time, D'Artagnan was a musketeer, so they just called the, the musketeers. Then in 1949, they went back and adapted the first book, the one we know as The Three Musketeers. Uh, that one they called La Jeunesse de, de Mousquetaire, which literally means the youth of the musketeers. But that sounds a bit awkward in English. In English, you'd naturally translate it either the musketeers in youth or the young musketeers. Probably the young musketeers would be the easiest way to uh to translate that uh now mond and nansen uh are only aware of the first two plays that remember i said that most a couple of errors in in their book uh, this is the other one robin hood was one this is the other um but there was a third one in 1861 dumas and i haven't been able to, to determine whether this was also with McKay or whether he did this on his own. By the, oh, by the way, I should mention that the first play is one of the few cases where Dumas actually publicly credited McKay uh, uh, as co-author and you know gave him credit publicly, um, which he seems to have treated as an act of, he seems to have regarded as an act of overwhelming generosity on his own part. Um, though I would say it was no more than Maquet's do. Uh, but anyway, uh, the third the third play Dumas may have done on his own. And the third play was called The Prisoner of the Bastille or The End of the Musketeers. And it's based on a portion of the third novel, uh, the, uh, the Vicomte de Bragelonne. Uh, because remember uh, that novel is a massive thing. Um, as you might guess from the title, if you know anything about about the story, uh, it it's the man in the iron mask part of the story. Uh, now, Dumas had planned and perhaps had begun some dramatic adaptations of more parts of the uh, 
of the final novel, but they were never finished, and it's not clear whether it, it looks like they don't even still exist. So we have, you know, corresponding to the trilogy of novels, there is a trilogy of plays. Are there translations of those? Well, yes. Are there good translations of those? Eh, not so much. Uh, so Frank J. Morlock has translated all three. Uh, the the Young Musketeers, the one that was was performed second, but is based on the first book. He translated as the Three Musketeers. Then uh, the play of the Musketeers, which was based on 20 years later, uh, or based on 20 years after, uh, Morlock published as the Musketeers 20 years later, after later, you know, um, uh, the uh, I mean, Dumas you know, used after for uh for the 20 years and later for the 10 years but anyway and then uh the play the prisoner of the bastille or the end of the musketeers uh morlock uh uh translate translated under the title the last of, of the three musketeers um and of course you know by that point it shouldn't still be called the three musketeers and Last of the Three Musketeers is a little bit misleading because it's not, it makes you, you think, oh, well, you see what to make it, you know, you see how it's misleading. Uh, these these plays are very, very literally translated. They're pretty faithful, but he's a, um, I have to say Morlock is not a great literary stylist. And it's kind of very pedestrian, thud, thud translation choices. I'll give you just give one, one example. And one of the plays, one of the main characters dies, and one of the other characters cries, Malheur, which I would have translated as alas, or if you want a translation that's a bit more modern and a bit freer, then I would have translated something like, What a tragedy, or something like that. He translated as bad luck. Now, out of context, bad luck is one perfectly acceptable translation of Mahler. But in this context, you know, you find one of your best friends dead and you yell, bad luck. It just, it's kind of a tin ear, I think. Um, so, you know, there isn't really a good translation of these plays, but there is a translation and that, and that's better than nothing. Uh, of course, these, uh, these plays do not credit, okay. Um, uh, these translations, and uh, they don't have any editorial matter at all. Um, the, you know. By the way, incidentally, uh, Dumas and McKay also wrote a four-part sta four stage adaptation of the Count of, Mo Count of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo Part One, Monte Cristo Part Two, the Count de Morcerf and Villefort, and the indefatigable Frank J. Morlock has translated those also, and those translations have the same virtues and vices as the Musketeers plays, but at least they have the virtue of existing, um, uh, which is, uh, as Anselm and Descartes were sure, is, is a perfection. Uh, again, of course, no credit to Maquet. 11. There's a fourth play in the trilogy of Musketeers plays as well. Not only is the three book Musketeers series of novels really kind of, sort of, a series of four books. Uh, so the three book Musketeers series of plays is really kind of, sort of, a series of four plays. Excuse me, but there's four of us. Uh, so there's this other play uh, from 1856, La Jeunesse de Louis XIV which literally would be the youth of Louis XIV, Louis the 14th, but uh, it would be you know, somewhat less awkwardly translated as Louis the 14th and youth, or still less awkwardly translated as young Louis the 14th. Uh, now, unlike the Red Sphinx, which takes place uh, between the first and second novels, this one takes place between the second and third novels. But it's like the Red Sphinx in that 
while D'Artagnan and Athos and Porthos and Aramis do not appear, the real life char historical characters who are main characters in those novels are also main characters in this play and their portrayal is continuous with their uh, portrayal in the novels and the other plays. And so they, they, again, they inhabit the same fictionalized historical universe. And you know, so I think there's, you know, I think that the case for including uh, young Louis XIV uh, among the Musketeers plays is as strong, or you might think as weak, but I'll say as strong as including the Red Sphinx in the uh, uh, list of uh, the Musketeers novels. Now, there's one complication with this play, Young Louis XIV. It exists in two versions. The first version was banned from the stage by the censors, and Dumas died before he had a chance to finish revising it. So the revision was completed by his son, Alexandre Dumas Fils, who of course was no mean playwright and novelist in his own right. He's probably best known for uh, the novel uh, Lady with the Camellias, which was the basis for both the uh, Verdi opera, opera La Traviata and the uh, Garbo movie Camille. Um, anyway, so there are these two versions. Morlock has translated one of the two versions. I'm not sure which one, because again, the Morlock translations have no editorial notes. Uh, he's translated as Young Louis XIV. But in this case, there is another translation. Barnett Shaw, and I don't know anything about Barnett Shaw other than this, but Barnett Shaw has published a translation that combines bits of both versions under the name Young King Louis. And you can find this in Barnett Shaw's translation, The Great Lover and Other Plays, which is a translation of four plays by Dumas. Uh, though the, uh, the only one that connects with the, the Musketeers verse is, uh, is Young King Louis. Um, that book is out of print, but it's findable at not insanely expensive prices. Um, uh, from the standpoint of literary style, Barnett Shaw is better than Morlock. If you compare, you know, compare the two side by side, looking at, um, you know, if you compare them both with the French, they're both pretty faithful to the French, although they're faithful to different versions, as I mentioned. But they're both pretty faithful. But in cases where they're dealing with the same passages, they're both pretty faithful. But you know, with Shaw, you're in, in, in good hands. This is, you can imagine someone actually performing this play. Um, uh, with uh, uh, you know, the Morlock, it's you know, it's a bit more you know, thud thud. Um, but I'm sorry that they're. I mean, there isn't some edition that some translation that clearly states uh, exactly which passages come from which version and which ones come from the other version. Uh, this one doesn't really do that, although it, does, it has a little bit of editorial matter, which is more than the zero that the Morlock has. 12. The original stories are more morally and politically complex than many of the popular adaptations. You know, so, you know, of course, there have been lots and lots of adaptations of, you know, especially of the first novel, but uh, of the other ones as well. Um, and the adaptations are often, not always, but often much more simplistic than the books. They usually portray Richelieu as a purely maniacally scheming villain. Dead or alive. I prefer. Kill him. Yeah. Now, Richelieu, Cardinal Richelieu in the books is a much more morally gray figure. Uh, he's, you know, sometimes he's a, an antagonist, but sometimes he's a protagonist. Uh, he's he's not just a scenery chewing uh, uh, villain. Although, you know, Tim Curry's performance in that clip that uh, comes from the 1993 movie, I think you know, is a lot of fun, but uh, it's, you know, it's not accurate to the books. Hello, everyone. Also, the Musketeers themselves are a lot more uh, 
gray and complex. Uh, Atos, for example, is a fairly unpleasant misogynist. Anamis is this pretty cold-hearted, unscrupulous, ruthlessly ambitious schemer who, you know, in some ways comes across as at least as villainous and maybe more villainous than the alleged antagonists. Um, and though he does, you know, he does have this one redeeming feature that he ultimately does have loyalty to his uh, his other um, uh, musketeers. So that loyalty is often tested because in the books, the musketeers often are often at odds with each other. Each other, they're often on opposite sides of various political struggles, and they have to reconcile their friendship and loyalty with each other with their loyalty to, uh, you know. Uh, whoever uh, they are uh, on the side of, or in Adamus's case, is mostly his loyalty to himself. Now, Dumas himself was politically kind of complex too. I mean, officially he was a uh, all for uh, republicanism. He played an active role in the 1830 revolution in France and later again in the 1860 Risorgimento in Italy. But Dumas had a kind of a soft spot in his heart for kings. I'm saying Dumas because I don't know that much about McKay's personal stuff, but I, yeah, his personal life, but I know quite a bit about Dumas. Dumas had a soft spot in his heart for kings. He was very susceptible to royal flattery. Uh, he, uh, you know, when he was invited to go visit Louis Philippe, he was sort of walking on air. Um, uh, and I think that the Musketeer novel's portrayal of the Bourbon cause in France and the Stuart cause in England is, shall we say, unduly, un, unduly generous. Uh, but, you know, still uh, very enjoyable stories. Okay, the next two uh, facts uh, about the three Musketeers are a... Uh, a bit more tenuously connected, but they're kind of interesting. 13, later writers have introduced crossovers between the stories of D'Artagnan and Cyrano de Bergerac. The real life D'Artagnan and the real life Cyrano de Bergerac were contemporaries, but we have no idea whether they knew each other. And Dumas and Maquet don't have them meet either. But a number of later writers, because lots and lots of people have written more novels, particularly about the Musketeers, novels or plays or whatever about the Musketeers. A, no, uh, a number of later writers have succumbed to the temptation of doing kind of crossover. So look at the first one was uh, uh, the most famous, Edmond Rostand's 1897 play, Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, uh, which actually contains a cameo by D'Artagnan. Now, if you only know the 1950 movie version, well, the 1950 movie version is great. It's it's my favorite uh, film adaptation, uh, mainly because Jose Fer Jose Ferrer's uh, acting is so great. Though also, I think that the the Brian Hooker translation is, if I have some quarrels with it, is on the whole really uh, really captures the spirit. It doesn't stick almost quite as close to the letter as I might like, but it really does capture the spirit of the original. Oh, so that's the best movie version. But the movie version is somewhat abridged compared to the play, and in particular, it leaves out the D'Artagnan cameo. But in the novel, I'm sorry, in the play, uh, right after the duel toward the beginning of the, of the play, uh, a, uh, a musketeer uh, comes up to congratulate Cyrano on his... Uh, his excellent sword play in the duel and the musketeer turns out to be D'Artagnan. Now that little cameo wasn't enough for some later writers. Uh, so for example, in 1925, Henry Bedford Jones really uh, published a novel called The King's Passport which I have not read, uh, but in which uh, D'Artagnan and Cyrano de Bergerac meet. And then likewise in 1925, 
uh, not to be outdone, uh, Paul Feval Fis. I say Paul Feval Fis because his his, uh, his father, Paul Feval Pere, was also a writer, and he wrote lots of similar stuff, lots of adventure stuff, even some science fiction. Um, he uh, released a four volume uh, novel called D'Artagnan versus Cyrano, uh, which he followed up three years later with a three volume novel, D'Artagnan and Cyrano Reconciled. So it was, you know, so there are you know, seven volumes of D'Artagnan and Cyrano interacting. And there was also a 1964 film, French film, uh, called Cyrano and D'Artagnan, reversing the order, uh, where Jose Ferrer actually reprises his role uh, from the 1950 movie, although, uh, although I haven't seen it from all the evidence I've been able to acquire about it. Um, it is not a worthy successor to the 1950 film, and you can safely skip it. But still, it is a... Uh, it, and you know, for one thing, Ferrer's dialogue is dubbed in French, so you're not even getting the full range of his acting. Um, but everyone says that, you know, all the critics have said that his acting is not nearly as good in this one as in the previous one anyway. And Ferrer himself said, well, the, the film was never finished. They ran out of money. Uh, so anyway, it doesn't sound like a, a jam. Um, okay. 14. Why there's a candy bar named after the Three Musketeers? So you're probably aware that there is a candy bar called Three Musketeers. In my day, they even had a picture of Three Musketeers on the wrapper, although the current wrapper uh, no longer has them, and I'm not really sure when they dropped off. Uh, but why is it called Three Musketeers? Well, there's sort of a reason. Uh, at least there's a reason for the three. I don't know if there's a reason for the Musketeers. The reason for the three is that when it first came out in the 1930s, uh, the candy bar actually was three different little candy bars in one package, one chocolate, one strawberry, and one vanilla. Uh, and that, that idea of having three things, chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla, I mean, that's a pretty, that was a pretty common thing of lots of different things. But anyway, there was this, so this uh, a Three Musketeers packet would actually have these three little candies in it. Uh, in 1940s, because of the war and sugar rationing, it became cheaper uh, to drop the strawberry and vanilla and just stick with the chocolate. Um, and also I think it may have been cheaper to make one big bar than three little ones. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, reportedly they, um, that was when they dropped it. Uh, the, um, so that's why it was, it was called three. As for Musketeers, they may have just gone with Musketeers because it was a popular, uh, well-known and in the public domain uh, three thingy. Uh, they could have named it after the Holy Trinity, but that might have been more controversial. You'd have to argue which one uh, is which. There's got to be a chocolate and a Jesus, but, but surely God the Father should be the chocolate. Um, oh, and then uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit can can have a fight over strawberry and vanilla. Um, yeah, actually, one possibility as to what it called the Three Musketeers is originally the idea was that these things, because, because they came in threes, they could be shared. And even after they became one bar, originally the bar was, was not long and thin like this. It was this bigger shape like that. And the, it was still advertised as something you could share. Although I'm not sure how many people did share them. Uh, and so maybe the idea was that the, the famous slogan of the Musketeers, all for one and one for all, uh, which is not nearly as big a thing in the novels as it is in the adaptations, although it is based on something in the novels. Um, but it's not like their official slogan or anything. But, um, but that sort of became their official slogan popularly. And you, know, you might think that maybe... A, a big chocolate bar you could share with your friends somehow captures the solidarity of the Three Musketeers. I don't know. Uh, 
it's pretty tenuous but still there it goes okay so those are the 14 facts but i also want to give you a a little bonus <laughs> namely uh some uh advice as to how to read them if you want to read them in diegetic order that is if you want to read these musketeers works in the order in which they take place as opposed to the order in which they were published uh uh so uh and also like which editions so i'd say start out you start with the first novel three musketeers either the pavere or the ellsworth translation although as i said the oxford edition is also useful to consult for the notes uh then second the, the play the young musketeers or uh morlock's translation is the three musketeers and third the novel The Red Sphinx, which Ellsworth has translated, which comprises Le Comte de Moray and the Dove, but wickedly leaves out one chapter, as I mentioned and grumped about. Fourth, the novel 20 Years After, uh, which is now available in two parts from Ellsworth, 20 Years, late, 20 years After and Blood Royal. Uh, though again, the Oxford edition, which is one volume, is still useful for its notes. Five, the play The Musketeers, which Morlock translates as The Musketeers 20 years later, not after. Uh, six, the play Young Louis XIV, or Young King Louis. Uh, I would recommend the Barnett Shaw translation in his book, The Great Lover and Other Plays. Although if you want to compare the two versions, Morlock's uh, Young Louis XIV is also useful. Seven, the novel, the massive sprawling novel, Le Vicomte de Bragelonne. Currently, you're stuck with the Oxford three part translation of Le Vicomte de Bragelonne, Louise de la Valliere, and The Man in the Iron Mask, because Ellsworth has completed only one of his projected four volume translations, uh, namely Between Two Kings. And that one hasn't even come out yet, although I think it's it's due to come out within a month or two, last I checked. Uh, you know, so if you're reading these, if you're starting reading these now, by the time you get to that one, probably that will be out and maybe the next one too. Uh, eight, The Prisoner of the Bastille or the End of the Musketeers, which more like translates as The Last of the Three Musketeers, which I've complained about the inaptness or ineptness of that title but um uh you know last of the three musketeers would say you know the three and this is the last of the three we actually means the, the last in the sense of the end of the, like oh that's the last of those musketeers that's the sense in which so both team meant but anyway meaning it's the ending and is but anyway prison of the bastille is the is the real title but uh well, like once to get the musketeers in, there's a bit of a, a feeling of a, of a hustling and uh, you know, from both Morlock and Ellsworth a bit here. Um, and of course, none of these things, none of these works uh, have McKay on the cover, and uh, and that is a crime about which I continue to grump. Also, as I mentioned, of course, you know the Count of Monte Cristo. Also, uh, you know the the, those uh, four plays that uh, Dumas and Maquet broke that book into are published in four volumes, and, uh, which Morlock just gives the title Count of Monte Cristo, part one, part two, part three, part four, to the four. Um, uh, those are also available. Uh, and, yeah, and of course, I've also mentioned in this video uh, the recent translation of Georges, which, uh, as I said, soft pedals some of the uh, perhaps racism on Dumas' part or Dumas and Mavie's part, because of course that's also co authored, although with someone else, uh, toward uh, uh, slaves of unmixed African ancestry, full blooded blacks. But um, but still, it's a it's a good book. There's, I don't have a a strong view about 
uh, what the relative roles of Dumas and Malfi were in making that book. There's not as much evidence about that, at least not that I've been able to find, as it is about Dumas and Maquet. Um, you get the same range of views about that book, that either that you know, Malfi really wrote the whole thing and Dumas just put his name on it, versus uh, the view that Malfi just wrote a rough outline and then Dumas really filled it all in. The difference is that I haven't seen any decisive evidence one way or the other or anywhere in between for Georges. But anyway, it's a good book. And I don't know, you know, this translation may soft pedal some of the racist stuff, which you might think is a bug or a feature. Uh, uh, but um, uh, it's a, a feature in terms of, you know, less discomfort while reading it, a bug in terms of, of uh, historical accuracy. Um, but anyway, that's a it's a recent and fairly widely praised for the most part uh, translation. And so, um, you know, if you want to spend a lot of time reading uh, 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 Dumas and Maquet and Malfi, those are those are some anyway the, uh, of the works that, that Dumas was involved with. These are some of the best ones. Uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, you should read the novel first before the plays. The plays are interestingly different from the novel in some ways. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, and then there's uh, Georges. You've got the Musketeers novels and plays, you've got the Monte Cristo novel and plays, and you've got Georges. Dumas wrote, Dumas wrote with and without other people, plenty of other stuff, but that's probably, the, the things I've just mentioned are probably the, uh, you know, the, uh, creme de la creme, uh, in my humble opinion. And uh, so that is my little compendium of uh, Dumasian information. And see you next video.